sliding scale. There's no uh, uh, lesser, lesser degrees of white robes, like shades of gray in, in this life. No, the reward is eternal life. When he says in Revelation 22, he says, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to those who obey and keep my commands. That is the reward of eternal life, dependent upon your patient continuance in doing, if ye continue, as Jesus says all the time. Always in the subjunctive mode, meaning an action that may or may not take place depending on circumstances, depending on whether or not you obey it. So this business about everybody's self-righteous and trying to be as perfect as God and the free gift is the whole package, see, that's another major flaw. See, they look at the free gift as the whole package. Not just remission of past sins, it's past, present, and future, then eternal life guaranteed in Christ no matter what. No strings attached. That's why even the folks that say they don't believe in what they call eternal security these days still won't tell you that it's your final outcome of your salvation in the age to come, yet to be reaped, is dependent upon your deeds, good or evil. They won't tell you that. But I will. I'm telling you that because the Scripture says that. The Scripture tells you that over and over again that you're going to be judged according to your deeds done in faith. Not your deeds done in the law of, of rituals and ordinances. No, in circumcision. Look in Galatians when he's talking about the law, he's, he constantly uses the word circumcision. So the circumcision rituals are not going to cleanse you of your former sins. Only the blood of Christ is. And then your faithfulness to continue, continue on to, and endure to the end, as he said. So there it is. that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And the scripture fulfilled that he became a friend of God, like we go back to James chapter 2, in verses 22 to 24. But see, Abraham was declared righteous by what he did and not by faith alone. James dispensing the argument of this nonsense of receiving and trusting or some nebulous understanding of faith that Christ died for your sins and all that is going to save you. No, he puts it together and shows that it must occur in tandem simultaneously as part one part of another thing. That's what synergy is. Two or more things working together to produce a result that cannot otherwise be attained. That's what the word is used in verse 22 and 24 of James chapter 2. That they also deny. They also will never ever talk about the necessity of that working together with God. So that's what the scripture says. The scripture nowhere says that he, is our, he is our righteousness in the sense that it's transferred. It nowhere says... And I've had many a pastors try to dispute me on this, that Christ is imputed as our righteousness. And, well, it's in there. It's, well, show me where it's in there. It's nowhere in the New Testament. Faith is imputed as righteousness. Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter, Romans 9. Many, many places, that's way, the way it's talking about. And imputed simply meaning, meaning that it's considered righteous. And we'll get into that in a minute here. So self-righteousness, then, is simply attempting to establish your own righteousness, like the Jews were doing in Romans cha chapter 10. They were attempting to establish their own righteousness, not submitting to the righteousness of God, which is what? By faith. Not only just a knowledge, faithfulness. So they were ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, not submitted to the righteousness of God. Submitted to what? To repentance and faith, just like John the Baptist told them. You brood of vipers, who told you to flee the wrath of God? Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. You want the reward of eternal life? Then your deeds must be pure and holy, filled with integrity and doing what's right and uprightness. Not full of hypocrisy and vile and, and, and beguiling people. He told them they were dead men bones. Well, that's exactly what these people that think they have a magic transfer. They're filthy on the inside, but they think they're pure on the outside. God don't see them sinning anymore because Jesus is their advocate. See, it's nonsense. No, it's what you sin is what you do, not what you are. You can't separate sin from the sinner like they keep saying, well, he loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. That's not as ridiculous. Sin is an action that you take. It's not a malady that's within you. So that's what self-righteousness is, appearing to ordinances and religious activities, like all the religious activities in your churches. You don't, you don't talk about much that, well, I'm not working my salvation, but you're doing all kinds of religious activities. You're giving all your money to support these heretics. 
observances of days, new moons, Sabbath, dress codes, rules, regulations, all forms of godliness denying the power of a godly life. And then the Jews, thinking that that would remit their past sins, their willful transgressions, that was severely in error. And of course, the, the, the professed church, they don't think that's going to remit their, remit their past sins. I can't accuse them of that, certainly, because they think they're under the blood no matter what they do. But they still do the works. And then they call anybody that's not living in sin like they are self-righteous and liars. Well, see, biblical righteousness then, doing what is right as God commands, is first producing deeds worthy of repentance, coming clean with God in repentance to be reconciled, returned to favor through the blood of Christ at the mercy seat, and then walking uprightly with, in faith and keeping your heart pure by faith, working by love, by working out your salvation, by adding to your faith, by making your calling sure, as all the scripture says. So they say then that that makes salvation dependent on what you do instead of on the finished work of Christ. Oh, I'm talking about the finished work of Christ. Yes, it is dependent on what you do. Initially, your past sins are cleansed by the blood of Christ. Dependent upon your repentance coming clean with God. Your broken sincerity and genuineness coming, coming to God forsaking your past sins. Remember, he who covers his sins shall not prosper. He who confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. They've got to forsake their sins or they won't find mercy. But that's their argument while you're trying to add to the cross. He says, in making our righteousness then counted as a merit to earn eternal life where nothing can be added, it's already that free. The free, free gift being the whole package then. See, again, the flawed understanding is where the, the unreasonableness comes in, in the accusations. So any mentions then of righteousness is self-righteousness because all our righteousness is filthy rags. That's like where it says none righteous in Romans. They never take into consideration what Paul's talking about. He's quoting Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. That each of those psalms begin, they're almost identical. The, the evil man is set in his heart, the wicked is set in his heart, there is no God. Among those, there's no righteous. <clears throat> and among those were Jews and Gentiles would say such a thing. They were the ones that were swift to shed blood, that their tongue was full of cursings and blaspheming and all the rest of the things he talks about in Romans chapter 3. They never take that into consideration. They just say, none righteous, no, not one. Everybody's sin, no matter what they do. Well, what about the people in the scriptures? What God's pronounced righteous cannot be self-righteous. God has pronounced that Abel attained witness that he was righteous by offering God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother. It says Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous in Luke 1.6. Uh, Cornelius was a righteous, what I say, a just man in, in Acts uh, 10.22. And it goes on in Acts, and in, in, in later on there, it talk, Peter says that any nation that, that worketh righteousness, that fears God and worketh righteousness, is accepted by him. Well, worketh righteousness by what? By faithfulness to him. Not by rituals, not by circumcision, not by appearance to days and new moons and all the rest of it, but by appearance to Jesus Christ and his commands. And following him, dying to sin, that's the important part. The old man's got to be put to death in sin. The old man that you created, got to crucify that flesh with its passions and desires. Not, not the, the, the skin and the bones. You don't drive nails through your hands. But you crucify those evil passions and desires that have taken you captive. So what God's declared righteous cannot be unrighteous. Daniel, Job, and Noah were delivered by their own righteousness, it says in Ezekiel 14, a couple of times. Enoch was perfect in his generation. Noah, the psalmist, declared his own righteousness many times. See, Jesus didn't call, come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. It says that in all three Gospels. So why would it say that he didn't come to call the righteous, those that were already expecting the Messiah, those like Elizabeth and Zacchaeus, those like Cornelius, those like Lydia, that were, that were of the faithful of Israel, that were expecting the Messiah and came to him, knowing his blood was going to cleanse their whatever past sins they may have committed willfully. Yes, they would be under the same covenant of Christ as Daniel was, as Moses was, as Abraham, anybody that came by faithfulness to God. They were under the same covenant of the promised Messiah. So they didn't need repentance. There's, there's, and then there's that scripture that says, blessed is that the, there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, over, and then 99 
just people who need no repentance. Luke 15, 7. See, again, well, why would Jesus say such a thing if there was no such thing as a righteous person, a person in right standing with God by a faithfulness that he attained